When you left me on that godforsaken spit of land, you forgot one very important thing, mate. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. Oh, shit. Wrong movie. Master and Commander! The far side of the world! Released in 2003 and is directed by Peter Weir, who has directed such masterpieces like Witness, The Truman Show, and one of my personal favorites in my top five, Dead Poet Society. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Hey, that works here. The film stars Russell Crowe, Paul Bettany, James Darcy, and Billy Boyd. And this movie was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, and it won two of them in the realms of cinematography and sound editing. All the other ones, it lost to Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Rightfully so. The film is set during the Napoleonic Wars, basically in the early 1800s. Don't ask me any more details about them, because I could not tell you. Russell Crowe plays Captain Jack. I got a jar of dirt, I got a jar of dirt, and guess what's inside it? That is basically the premise of this movie. It's just one giant good old-fashioned dogfight. One ship is hunting the other, and then sometimes the hunter becomes the hunted. It's a very simplistic story. Jack, go get the ship! Oh, okay doesn't really get deeper than that. And when I watched it many years ago, I think because of its simplistic story that I thought it was kind of dull and boring at the time. But this time around, I had to say, I was pleasantly surprised. I was HMS surprised. I think that since viewing it in 2003, my knowledge of film has grown exponentially, and so I was able to pick up on all these subtle aspects of the film, and I was able to appreciate them a lot more. I mean, this movie won two Academy Awards in cinematography and sound editing, and watching it this time, absolutely. There were several exterior shots of this actual sailing ship that was converted for this movie, and they are absolutely beautiful. There is just something about seeing a ship out in that vast blue blanket called the Atlantic Ocean that is just so liberating. I mean, Captain Jack, what did you say your ship was? It's freedom. Again, not the right movie, but God, basically the same idea. I've been on the Atlantic Ocean and yeah, you get a sense of freedom when you're out there. But the best shots of this movie are all done in the interior of this ship. I mean, the cameraman does a great job of showing you the crampness and the heat and the claustrophobia of being in a ship with all of these people in such a small space. Oh, and by the way, if you get motion sickness very easily, don't watch this movie. Because probably the coolest thing about the cinematography is that the camera rotates back and forth, just like it would if you were on the ocean. It was a really cool trick that I caught on to about halfway through the movie, and when I did, mm, really enhanced my viewing. Oh, it just sets the audience in that atmosphere. And the sound design is absolutely tremendous as well. Now, I think for the first third of this movie, there was no score, there was no music. It was all just sound effects. The sounds of the water in the ocean, the sounds of the wood of the ship, the sounds of the cannonballs, weeping right past your head. It was just pure sound and it was so cool. And I definitely recommend watching the special features of this movie because they go through how they got all these sounds. It's super fascinating. And then when the score does kick in, it was just as fascinating to listen to because it was mainly all strings, in particular the cello, which if you tell me that there's gonna be cello music, I'm there. And this movie did love playing the Bach cello suite number one in G major. And I know you've heard it before, it goes like this. You know, if you ask most people, what music do you rock out to? Most people would say, you know, 80s rock, 70s rock. I mean, you give me a good cello piece and that's what I rock out to. And actually, I would rather listen to cello covers of famous rock and pop songs than the actual songs themselves. <laughs> I never realized how silly that sounds until I said it out loud like that. I'm serious, I have a whole playlist of just cello covers that I listen to at work all the time. 
It's the best. Oh, embarrassing facts about Caleb. The movie is technically stunning to watch, but the simplistic story, although it appealed to me better this time around, just kind of made me start thinking, why do I care about these people? I mean, it's cool to see the camaraderie and the naval order of this environment, but then when these individual people start getting picked off in these battles, I just start thinking, why, why do I care? And in that aspect, I think this movie is a little too simplistic. But the big relationship that this movie focuses on is Russell Crowe's and Paul Bettany's character. Paul Bettany plays the doctor on this ship, and you can tell that he and Russell Crowe's character have a long history together. They've been friends for a very long time. You know, kind of thinking about it, their relationship is the exact same as Kirk and McCoy from Star Trek. And McCoy and Bettany do serve a tremendous purpose on this ship, but you can tell they don't quite fit into the environment. Bettany is a doctor, but he's also a scientist, and he's looking to better mankind through knowledge and discovery. And Crow is trying to help extend the mighty arm of the British government to better the world. Both of them have the same end goal, but they both have very different paths on how to get there. It's a great relationship to see because they both oppose each other, but they're still best friends. Wow. What a concept, right? And Crow is such a badass in this movie. He gets all the cool shots of him hanging off the ship like he owns the place. Well, he's captain, so I guess he kind of does. But you can just tell, this captain is a very cool dude. I and mean, he's confident, he's strict, he never shows weakness, he always has an answer whenever his orders are questioned, but he always rewards good hard work if it's earned. And those are the qualities of an exceptional leader. Very cool character, and you know what? I'd probably serve under him. So guys, in the end, Master and Commander is a fine cinematic achievement in the realm of cinematography and sound editing. You know, if you pick up on the subtleties of the making of this movie, it is a great watch. But this movie is pretty simplistic in its story, and it doesn't have any lasting impact that would make me want to just keep watching it over and over and over again. So I'm going to give Master and Commander the far side of the world four out of five Blu-rays. It's good. It's good. Good. This movie did end on a cliffhanger that would definitely lend itself to a sequel, but it just never happened. It wasn't a failure at all at the box office, but it just didn't make the revenue that would warrant a sequel. I mean, the movie did cost $150 million. Very hard to make a huge profit when your budget is that much. All right, everyone, now comes my favorite part in my videos where I randomly select which movie I'm watching next. Let's take a look. Speed! Get off my train! Nope. Sorry, wrong movie. This movie I know did come out in 1994, has Sandra Bullock, Keanu Reeves. It's one of the best action movies ever made. And I'm sure many of you have seen this movie before. It's on TV all the time, but why not? Let's give it an official watch for Caleb Watches Movies. All right, everyone, have you seen Master and Commander? What did you think about it? Or if you've never seen it before and you stumbled across it because of this video, please comment below, let me know what you thought about it. And when you're done commenting, please like and subscribe to my channel so you know the next time I'm posting my next movie review. All right, everyone, I will see you next time with my review of Speed, the movie, not the drug. So in the meantime, be well, be good to each other, go watch a movie. Take care, guys.